I'm privileged to have the conversation today with Dr. Anthony Penn. It's funny, we've sort of I've almost met him in about six, seven different occasions. Like we brushed <laughs> by each other. And uh, I've been uh, a, an admirer of his work. I'm kind of amazed at how prolific he is. Like I've written two books and they're not even that good. He's written a library. <laughs> He's written and edited a library of books. He's done all this speaking and activism. And I'm like, where do you find the bandwidth? You know, And yet he has found a few minutes for us here. If I can, a quick introduction for those who may not be familiar with Dr. Penn. He got his PhD from Harvard back in 1994, which is weird for such a young fellow. He has uh, an MA and Master of Divinity from Columbia. He is an educator of religious studies and humanities. He's a professor at Rice University in Houston, the director of research for the Institute of Humanist Studies Think Tank in Washington, D.C., and he has written and or edited, uh, what is it, about 30 books or so, Dr. Penn? Is that correct? How does one write or edit 30 books? Uh, one, you have to enjoy um, writing and editing. It's uh, It's a... It's a highlight for me, and so I, I don't find it uh, a chore. Uh, for me, it's a privilege, and so I try to maximize the opportunities to get some of that writing done. Give me, if you would, a rundown of some of the books that you've written, what they're about, how they're themed. Well, most uh, one of the most uh, recent books is uh, titled uh, When Colorblindness Isn't the Answer, um, and it's concerned with uh, trying to get humanists to more substantially engage issues of difference, uh, issues of, of social disregard. And this book kind of looks at the particular challenge of race and racism uh, and tries to contextualize issues of race and white privilege and offer some ways to move beyond some of the more problematic uh, positions concerning race and racism within our movement. Now you've done it. You said the word privilege. You said the <laughs> word white privilege. And I can already hear the mashing of keyboards in the comments section. Um, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to talk about race in relation to humanism and you know just human beings in general. Uh, first of all, I'm intrigued by a book title. You'd written a book called Writing God's Obituary. R.I.P. God. I mean, what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm concerned with, in that book, um, providing a sense of, of how one moves away from theism towards humanism and atheism. And so I use portions of my own story as a way to contextualize that move. Um, and it's also an opportunity to kind of rethink the positioning of people of African descent within the humanist movement. We tend to downplay the significance of that population, we tend to misunderstand historically how long uh, African Americans have been involved in this uh, philosophy of life. And so I use my own story as a way of getting at how African Americans move in this direction, what some of the challenges are in terms of that sort of movement. And for those reading the text who are not humanists or atheists, I, I hope it serves to kind of humanize humanists and atheists. I'm a big fan of Sam Harris. Uh, we disagree. We part ways, you know, here and there, but I'm a fan of his writings and I appreciate his activism. He's been a harsh critic of quote unquote identity politics. We define it for our listeners and viewers and get your take on identity politics, Dr. Penn? Well, I can't speak for him, but um, it, it seems to me that a common understanding of identity politics involves an effort to use uh, categories, social categories of difference as a way to think about public engagement in public space. That is to say, to use race as a way of measuring the American dream, using race as a way of measuring the democratic process, using race as a way of explaining and exploring how populations move through life within the context of the United States. So singling one specific demographic out, an identity per se, to speak specifically about the challenges and opportunities they have, perhaps because and, and of... Understand, and it's a, it's a process of understanding how particular 
social categories like race have impacted life options for a population. It, it seems to me that, uh, that at its best, this sort of conversation exposes white privilege and gives us an opportunity to see how race, gender, class, et cetera, have been used to stifle life opportunities for certain populations. There's a lot of narrative out there that, uh, I used to be a hardcore, I don't know how much you know about me, but I used to be a true blue Fox News conservative Christian. I mean, I was that guy, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I listened to Rush Limbaugh and, and Michael Savage, and I was a fundamentalist Bible believer. And, you know, we used to speak very much in black and white terms, you know, binary terms, mm -hmm. uh, oversimplifying extremely complicated and nuanced things. Poor people, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Some of the most, some of the greatest success stories in the history of humankind came from nothing. There are no excuses. You know, we used to, to have this sort of whitewashed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. narrative about poverty. And, you know, we were blind, many times willingly so, about the societal blockades placed in front of people who, mm -hmm. you know, the deck was stacked against them from day one. This being a very real thing, right? Right. Right. And you speak to some of this in your own work and writings? Yes, and I try to do that in a variety of ways. One, um, I, I try to highlight the presence of racial minorities uh, within humanist and atheist circles, right? So that we can break away from the assumption that racial minorities are new to this enterprise, that this is a pri primarily a white enterprise and those who look like me are new arrivals. It also becomes a way of providing a more balanced understanding of the Enlightenment and the role that the Enlightenment plays in the development of, of humanist thinking and doing. Right, that if you bring into conversation race or minorities, for example, within this humanist and atheist conversation, it becomes a way of highlighting the degree to which these populations were the underbelly of the Enlightenment, right? That the Enlightenment takes place at their expense. And I think that allows us to kind of rethink humanism's relationship to issues of disregard. I'll give you an example. I've not met very many humanists or atheists who are not fans of Thomas Jefferson. But as soon as you bring Thomas Jefferson into this camp, You've also brought into humanist and atheist thinking sexual violence and racial disregard. And rather than just covering this up, it seems to me humanists and atheists do well to interrogate this movement's relationship to social harm. Now, are we speaking about the fact that he was a slave owner and, and those types of things? Or Oh, sure. Yeah. So I, I don't know how we bring... Uh, a Thomas Jefferson into this conversation and not recognize the degree to which humanism was not always and was not consistently applied as a method of freedom and liberation for the most disadvantaged. That humanism and atheism often supported the status quo. Do we have a uh, racism problem? In the uh, atheist quote unquote movement, and I know good luck defining the movement. This is a whole other broadcast, but um, you speak a lot about issues in regard to to color and race and culture. Do I mean we we're not immune, right? We're human beings, and and it's an imperfect atheist culture as well. Can you speak to that? Oh, sure, sure. I have no doubt, but that there are there are bigots, there are racists within our movement, but there's also a rather troubling assumption, a more pervasive and troubling assumption that humanism and atheism, right, non-theological and non-religious movement through the world is somehow a prophylactic against injustice, right? The underlying assumption being, I'm not a Christian. I understand that these categories, these social constructs like race are not biologically real, hence I don't contribute to this problem, that this problem lies within the realm of theism. It's that sort of thinking that prevents us from really doing the hard work 
that provides better life options for those who've been disadvantaged. We assume we are somehow outside of that realm of harm. I've seen some uh, internet memes out there that say that, you know, if, if religion was eliminated, there would be no more war and strife and poverty and all of these social ills. And I think, well, yeah, it sounds pretty, but it's total bullshit. I mean, <laughs> you know. It's a statement. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, human beings will always be human beings. Religion, I think a religion-free world would be a better world. It would be less violent. There would be less oppression because so much of it is motivated by religion. I mean, do you think that has merit? I, I think, well, I, I'm a humanist, so I, I understand that uh, theism can be problematic, right? And I'd like to make a distinction here that as a, a, as a humanist, my concern is the way in which theism allows for disregard, right? It allows for harm. I make a distinction between religion and theism. It seems to me that religion is simply a tool. It's a, it's a method for interrogating the world, and it's not charged in any particular way. But it's the belief in supreme forces, transhistorical realities that creates the problem here. But I'd also say that one doesn't have to believe in gods or God in order to do harm in the world. And, and so from my vantage point, my primary concern is decreasing the harm that theists do in the world and interrogating and decreasing the harm that non-theists, that humanists and atheists do in the world. When I was, in, I was a Christian broadcaster, we used to play a song by an artist named Michael W. Smith, and it was called Colorblind. And it was this happy, clappy song, sung by a white guy, by the way. But, I mean, it was like, why can't we all be colorblind? We know we should. We could be better. Meaning that if we just stopped seeing color and saw each other as human beings, I appreciate the sentiment behind it. But uh, is that a healthy way of approaching color and race and the distinctions between us? You know, the differences, the diversity? Because I, part of me is like, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure removing color from the equation, even if it had merit, would even be possible. What's your take? It's a, that approach is immature and harmful. It leaves in place white privilege. It doesn't tackle white privilege. It also assumes that difference is a negative, that difference is a problem to solve, as opposed to seeing difference as an opportunity. And so think about this in terms of a personal example. For me, it is not a problem that people see me as a black man. The problem is negative assumptions they make concerning black men. Do you experience these things even now, your own life? I, I think there are assumptions made concerning me before people get to know me. I, I, this is the consequence of race within the United States, right? And the consequences of race are not finally solved simply through economic means, right? I'm a I'm a middle-class academic who lives in a certain type of world, but that world still bends to the will of racial conversation and racial disregard. Uh, there's no way to get around that. Now, so the ways in which I encounter race and racism will be different than how some others encounter it, but it is still a truth that in the context of the United States, Regardless of one's economic positioning, race matters. I'm talking here with Dr. Anthony Penn. Let's go back in time to seminary. When was this, <laughs> roughly? Let's go back to your religious education. I mean, what roughly time period are we talking about? Well, I, I finished college in 86. I did the Master of Divinity degree from 86 to 89 and a master's degree, and then finished the Ph.D. in 94. Okay, so it's interesting to me. I, seminary seems to be sort of a, a dividing line for some. I mean, you have some who go through seminary and they become more entrenched in the faith, and then you have, you know, the Bart Ehrmans and the Robert Prices and the others who, you know, they've been through seminary, but they sort of <laughs> diverge and they begin to see some real problems. Was seminary a galvanizing thing for you? Were you a believer in your religious studies at the time? Paint that picture for me. I was a different type of believer at that point, right? I, I went to college, uh, went to Columbia with an understanding that 
my responsibility was to prepare for ministry and transform the world for Jesus. You graduated from seminary, you were still a believer, and you were moving toward the pulpit, is that correct? I was already in the pulpit. Um, as an undergraduate, I was going through the ordination process. So I was already reverend by the time I got to Harvard Divinity School. But my sense of ministry, my sense of God was radically changing. That I went to, I went to undergrad, having gone to a rather conservative Southern Baptist high school. I had a sense that God was the supreme authority that broke into human history and made things happen, a rather strict sense of God. By the time I left New York, I had a very different sense of God. Um, a God who tries to persuade us towards the good, doesn't make us do anything, but tries to persuade us towards the good. So my sense of God was shifting, but for me, God was still real and ministry was still really important. But by the time I got, um, I got to uh, uh, Boston, Cambridge, my sense of ministry involved something more along the lines of an Adam Clayton Paul Jr., a sense of ministry that engaged the world, didn't hide from the world, uh, a type of ministry that, so to speak, rolled up its sleeves and got dirty. This was my sense of ministry. But as I, I worked in a church in Boston and, and had opportunity to test my theological thinking within real world context, it became increasingly difficult to maintain my belief in God that what I encountered in the world, the hardships in the world, were not adequately addressed through my theology. And it reached a point where it was extremely difficult for me to believe that it was just my personal theology that was flawed, that I found it increasingly difficult to believe that there was anything substantive behind theism in a more general sense. And so it reached a point as I moved through the Master of Divinity program and was beginning the PhD program, it reached a point where I had to make a decision. Either I was going to spend my life safeguarding this theistic tradition, or I was going to be committed to the well-being of people. And I was willing to be a lot of things, but I was not going to be a hypocrite. I was not going to stand in the pulpit and preach what I did not believe. So I left the church and left theism. And people say now, do they say, well, you're just a religious humanist? Yeah, you're still religious. You're just religious in a different way. You hear that one? Well, some people say that, and I find no offense in that. Again, I want to make a distinction between theism and religion. That religion is a just a general process of trying to find meaning in life. It's a process of meaning making. It does not require God's. For me, the difficulty is theism. What I left is theism. So using a religious construct like so many, like the UU Church and other organizations and people who are using a religious construct for real-world endeavors to frame the human existence, that in your mind has merit then? I, what I, I, I don't have a difficulty with it. I, I mean, I, I don't either. I think you and I line up, right? I. Right. Honestly, if I, I think tradition, ritual, um, structure, call it religious structure, whatever, I think it has a lot of merit. And you, you, know, you can yeah. use these things to help build a foundation on which you can provide good to the world. I'll buy yeah. that. Well, for me, this, this theological language fills a gap. It has short-term significance. But I think over the long run, humanists and atheists have to develop their own vocabulary and grammar for capturing the wonder of life, for addressing the more effective or emotion-driven dimensions of our existence. And I think, for me, where the UU has fallen short, and I say this as a UU, is that it has not done an adequate job of developing an approach to celebration, an approach to life that is uniquely its own. It's Christianity light. The other criticism I have of you, you, is it seems extremely reluctant and hesitant to say, this is factually wrong. I mean, it's got such an open tent, which I appreciate. But if you see something that has been demonstrably 
debunked. We know this is not true. You know, someone walks in who has, let's make an extreme example, the flat earther walks in and they say, yes, come in. Your, your opinion, your perspective is welcome here. There's a seat at the table for everyone. I get that you're welcome, but not all ideas are meritorious ideas. And this is a challenge with the UU church. Do you have an opinion on that one? And that has not been my experience within UU circles. Um, from, from my vantage point, the challenge within UU circles is, is the development of something that is uniquely their own when they, it is a tradition that holds a creed of no creed. That is to say, it, it's based upon a, a collection of principles that work to secure the best of existing traditions right, without the strong disregard for these traditions. And so it doesn't have anything that is uniquely its own. This is the difficulty from my vantage point, that I've really not encountered UUs who would embrace uh, flat earth theories. Well, I mean, I'm right? not saying they'd put them on stage or anything like that, but, uh, you know, if you bring in Eastern religion, you bring in the fundamentalist Christian, you bring in whoever else walks in the door and say, we're all welcome, I buy that. But doesn't the UU sort of structure want to give voice to a great number of different positions, theological or otherwise? I mean, isn't it? it well, it's, 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 it has a theology that is expansive, but it has a commitment to issue of justice and freedom, right? And so all of these mindsets, all of these philosophies of life are funneled through a central question. Does this, on a moral and ethical level, move us towards justice and well-being? So it's not a position, from my vantage point, that treats all positions as equal to the extent all positions don't help us advance justice. Let's talk about the black church. You know, I've had conversations like these with Mandisa Thomas and Alex Jules and others, and we talk about the importance the church the church's role in civil rights through the decades, providing a hub, providing sanctuary, rallying points for those who were being discriminated against. The church played a very critical and important role. And yet, in many cases, the church is continuing to pitch, and you can correct me if this is, if you feel this is wrong, they're pitching ideas theological or otherwise, that are harming people, often harming the very people who are its greatest proponents. Can we talk about the black church then and now? Well, let's talk in terms of black churches, right? There is no the black church. There are black churches, a variety of denominations that don't theologically agree, right? So I'd, I'd want to preface it by that. Absolutely. I'd also, say, Absolutely. I'd also want to say that we overemphasize the significance of black churches during the civil rights movement. Even Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. acknowledged that the vast majority of black churches were not involved. Oh, I never heard that part before. They were not, the vast majority of black churches were not involved. We had always the, come to understand that this was where, this were, these were the rallying points all across the South, especially. Well, let's, let's, let's break this down. So one, the vast majority of black, uh, black churches were not involved, that not all black denominations agreed with Dr. King's approach, right? So they were not all involved. And so it's also fair to say that at times, what was valuable about these churches involved two things. They offered a space for organizing and they provided a quick a, a, a way to gather people quickly, right? That information could be spread quickly through church mechanisms. And they provided a space for meaning, uh, for meetings, right? We can say that, but we cannot say that the vast majority of churches were involved. It, 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 it allows us to dismiss humanist and atheist voices within this movement. So for example, what is the civil rights movement without A. Philip Randolph? And he's not alone. He is not alone. Uh, and, and so, again, I would want to modify the role that black churches play, right? That the vast majority were not involved. But the uh, narrative is that, you know, the church was there for us when no one else was. And uh, there's something sort of sacred. I mean, it now, according to um, 
a great many. If you now say that, you know, hey, I'm Dr. Anthony Penn and I'm an atheist and I'm black, many people say that you have not just betrayed God, but you've also betrayed your race. Is there any truth to that? Well, no, but you know, we don't have to abide by such ignorance, right? That, well, I'm that, not saying the statement's true, but I mean, the, the narrative is real, correct? Well, but, but here, this is what we have, that black churches have had good PR. That is not the same as being historically factual. <laughs> They've had good PR. All right. Excellent PR. PR that has extended the assumption of the reach beyond what is historically accurate. So they're taking the credit for, they're taking credit for moves they may not be responsible for. Exactly. And, and again, it dismisses it dismisses a significant portion of the black population without belief in God who was also involved in an activity during the civil rights movement. So even if we, let's move beyond the civil rights movement. After the civil rights movement, black churches, churches in general in the United States, experienced decline. And with respect to the black church, this decline is in place into the mid 1980s. Then you get a movement of black folks back into churches for a variety of reasons. After the civil rights movement, they played by the rules. They moved into the communities that you know, folks said they should live in. They went to the schools they were supposed to go to. They talked the talk they were supposed to talk and still hit a glass ceiling based upon race. But they had surrendered something of their cultural self-understanding. So some of the black middle class, for example, went back into black churches in order to culturally connect, to have a space in which they did not have to explain why they were angry, right? Did not have to explain why they were disillusioned. It is not safe to say that all of these folks went back because they believe what they were told theologically, but there was something much more secular at stake, cultural connections and social networking. Nobody and so is. within- No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Within the context of these churches then, you have humanists and atheists who are hiding out. Right, because if the theological claims of the pastor is the price they pay for cultural connections and social opportunities, even economic opportunities, it's a price they're willing to pay. Dr. Penn, in the moments of awe as a humanist, I mean, do you say spiritual, you know, the birth of a, of a child or a beautiful sunset or a, a transcendent piece of music? Do you call these spiritual experiences? No, the terminology of spirituality doesn't work for me. And so I just call these moments that merit celebration. These are moments that inspire awe. That, for me, that entails these being moments that pull us outside of ourselves. They pull us outside of ourselves, not into this cosmic reality called the divine, but they pull us out of ourselves into something bigger and better than ourselves. And that I would call community. That these are moments that target us, that humble us, and push us into a greater sense of being. And this greater sense of being involves a larger collection of life, community. Now, how can you experience true awe without God? How can it's you experience true awe without, if you, I, I hear it two ways. One is you're either insignificant and life has no meaning because you're going to die anyway. Or two, you think you are God, you're the center of the universe. How do you respond to the narratives that say, how could you genuinely experience life without the idea of a God with a capital G? All we have to do is look at the historical record. There are lots of folks without belief in God who did just fine, <laughs> right? That disbelief in God has not resulted in mass suicide on the part of folks. You, you can go through the historical record and see these folks, right? And again, because you can harness your life, you can harness your sense of meaning by connecting to a larger arrangement of life, other humans, the earth. Right? There are ways in which we are humbled, ways in which we are motivated and inspired that don't require God or gods. Is this sort of the, uh, the theme that you take when you're teaching the you know, humanistic studies, the you know, embracing the moment, you know, uh, uh, 
taking charge of life. We are only here for each other. How do you frame this for your students and those you speak to on the lecture circuit? Well, in terms of my, my rice responsibilities, I don't proselytize in the same way that I assume that my theistic colleagues don't proselytize. It's about critical thinking skills and effective communication strategies. Um, but my, my larger goal as a, as a humanist working within humanist circles is to get us to think in terms of a more robust philosophy of life, that science, education, and separation of church and state isn't all we ought to concern ourselves with that we have to give people a soft place to land. That is to say, we have to address a larger range of human needs, wants, and responsibilities. And so much of my work seeks to unpack that, right? To kind of help folks think through what it means to live humanism in a robust fashion. What does that mean in terms of ritual? What does that mean in terms of a social obligation? What does that mean in terms of political strategies and so on? Well, I mean, give me some specifics of it. What's the, uh, the end zone? What does it look like with the embracing of ritual and framing a humanistic life in this way? I, I think we can only get at that by negation. I don't know exactly what it will look like because we have to do this in terms of local communities. And so from my vantage point, from my particular context, I can't tell humanists across the country what this ought to look like for them. What I can suggest is that we might be able to do this by negation. We know what it doesn't look like. We know it doesn't involve embracing racism, sexism, homophobia, et cetera. We know it doesn't involve that. We know it doesn't involve simply belittling and mocking theists. It's gotta be more robust than that. That it cannot involve political positions and political conversations that are not concerned with those who suffer most, right? So we can do this by negation. We know what it doesn't look like. Would you support, like, I mean, if, if someone involves themselves and engages in community as a humanist, uh, especially those who've exited often with difficulty, religious cultures, they're nervous. I feel like I'm going back to church. This is atheist church. I'm just another sheep. Part of the flock, there's a shepherd on stage, you know. Oh, look, they're passing the hat. There's special music. This seems awfully religious. And we're gonna come we're coming back to that term religious. And they have real trepidation. They bring a lot of baggage, they bring often a lot of sure. hurt, you know. How do you approach that? Sure. First, I understand and appreciate that. But I also then want to push um, against one of the assumptions embedded in that thinking that only the religious have ritual which is far from the case. Anybody who goes to the American Atheist Convention every year or goes to the American Humanist Association Convention every year, participates in the activities, is involved in a ritual process. Ritual is simply repeated activities and founded space. So to sit together, to listen to that lecture, or to sit together and share a meal. That is ritual activity. So one does not have to believe in God. One does not have to go to church in order to appreciate ritual. We as humanists and atheists do it. No, don't and theistic my- organizations and entities, they're great, though, at stamping that brand of ownership on the things that human beings do naturally, aren't they? And we play along with it by assuming they're right. <laughs> Right, we assume that only the religious are involved in ritual. Only the religious can be concerned with life meaning. We've surrendered that to them. And from my vantage point, that makes absolutely no sense. I, I want to be part of the solutions out there. But what can I do? I mean, in relation to humanism, in relation to trying to eliminate hate trying to promote the best in people, the best ideas out there and in myself, trying to admit when I'm wrong, trying to just be better. Uh, you know, what do you think? I mean, what can I do? What can our viewers and listeners be doing to, to be a part of this sort of uh, evolution of the human condition? Well, I'll suggest a few things. One, recognize that injustice is real and has to be addressed, right? Recognize there is a problem. 
Secondly, recognize that we participate in this problem. Third, get informed, right? That it is insufficient for humanists and atheists to say, I just don't understand race. I, I don't know very much about it. Well, that's the starting point. It's not an excuse for remaining ignorant, right? In the same way that humanists and atheists would reject the idea of someone saying, right, you know, I really don't know about evolution. And so I, I don't really, I, I have no obligation to do anything related to this. We would find that objectionable. In the same way, a lack of information concerning racism or sexism or classism, for example, is an invitation to get informed. Read, study, but don't assume that these disadvantaged populations have an obligation, one, to excuse your ignorance, and two, to teach you. Get information. And when you say, as you said in your speech title and your book, color blindness is not the answer, how would you sum up the answer? What is the answer in the humanist movement, in atheist movements, in uh, the human condition? What's the answer? The answer is struggle against injustice, that this is perpetual, right? That there will, we as human beings will find ways to operate in accordance with disregard. And so for me, the key, the victory is a awareness of our circumstances and a commitment to saying no to injustice and struggling against it. That for me, it's not about outcomes. I can't predict the outcomes, but what I can say is our last best effort involves struggling against injustice, an informed and committed struggle against injustice. Dr. Anthony Penn, you are a pleasure to speak to. This is how I format many of my shows. I just invite people much smarter than myself, and I just let them talk, and when I take credit for their moves. So, you know, once again, I'm just going to check that off my box. And so <laughs> thanks very much for that. No, it really is. Uh, and I, again, I, I feel like I should apologize for all the opportunities that I almost jumped in there, but I just didn't want to be <laughs> that guy. But uh, if I see you at the American Atheist Convention or on the road, I promise uh, the next time I'll make every effort to bust through whatever circle is pining for your attention and shake your hand in person. It's an honor to be able to have this conversation. And I so appreciate your work. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it. I look forward to chatting with you.